vaccinated. And, um, and for the most part, um, you know, you have uh, Europe and uh, um, North America, you know, in the lead in terms of uh, the getting their people vaccinated uh, and uh, much of the rest of the world uh, less so. Um, it's not a, as we will discuss, I'm sure it's not a matter of uh, any uh, competence in terms of governance. I speak here from the United States, and uh, as far as COVID-19 goes, the, uh, the U.S. has been atrocious in terms of uh, its public health uh, practices as far as COVID-19's um, emergence here. Uh, we have uh, over 650,000 Americans put in the ground by COVID-19, uh, almost entirely out of uh, governmental incompetence. Um, so, um, that's kind of the general picture of where things are presently. Um, some topics I'll connect to is um, starting off here. This is a report by Mary Gilbert. He's a kind of disease ecologist out of Belgium. And uh, this is from really early in the outbreak. And he was concerned about, well, how, how is COVID going to come from uh, China and, and get into Africa? And, and uh, uh, you know, based on the kind of uh, the flight data uh, coming into Africa from various uh, cities in China, and also uh, an index of infectious disease risk, uh, as well as a state self-assessments of the kind of the hospital capacities and, and public health capacities of the countries. Uh, we can see here the kind of uh, importation risk for each of the countries. We have here the SPAR, which is a, the state self-assessments about where they are. I uh, uh, assume the, in the, the redder it is, the less capacity is presently available. And then uh, here, the uh, infectious disease vulnerability index uh, in red, more likely to be uh, um, allow a pathogen to, to spread about. Uh, I think um, a large point the Gilbert's group came up with is that those countries that are more likely to have importation, that are more integrated into the global travel network, also had the more of the uh, hospital capacity, although it's not always clear cut that way. Uh, he does go on later on here to kind of divide Africa into three niches here based on on those uh, indices and uh, divide into three clusters here uh, as far as their kind of common uh, combinations of uh, importation risk and uh, health uh, hospital capacity and such. And so that in red seems to be uh, 18 countries converged on some of the same uh, uh, variables uh, along, on, in this, along those three lines. So uh, you have Beijing, Guangdong, and Shangyi as being the sources. This is all early on at this point. It's, it's you know, not the case anymore. COVID's everywhere. But you do get a sense of uh, how one way uh, one of many ways, I'm sure, and I'm very much here to, to listen and learn from uh, people who have much uh, more experience on the ground of this, To uh, uh, but this is one way one can uh, divide Africa in terms of uh, the susceptibilities and the relationship to um, uh, the rest of the world. In blue, uh, more connections with Guangdong and Shenzhen, and then the cluster, the third in green, is uh, a direct connection with Fujian uh, province in, uh, in China. Um, so, you know, from this, uh, there was in the early, there was early, in terms of the early thinking about uh, the impact of COVID-19 on Africa, the, the thought was, oh, I mean, uh, here in the global south, uh, you know, there would be explicitly, uh, um, especially vulnerable uh, due to the kind of underlying comorbidities of other diseases that might uh, increase the, the spread and also the, dam uh, the damage of COVID-19. Uh, but also in addition, the, perhaps the, the lesser, you know, uh, industrial ho hospital capacity. On the other hand, as it's played out, as was very well known, uh, and as we just uh, began with, many of the African countries aren't being as hit as hard as uh, um, uh, as some of the um, uh, countries up in the, in the global north and also uh, elsewhere in, in South America has been especially hit. Um, and some of the explanations go along the lines of the kind of the younger demographics uh, in the global south. Uh, so the you know, death rates are uh, less to be uh, less likely. The more open housing that allows for greater ventilation um, that reduces the the, the viral uh, transmission. Uh, there's notions of um, uh, perhaps there's an already ongoing circulation of other kinds of coronaviruses that would induce a kind of natural partial immunity to COVID-19, even if it arrives 
uh, people carry a, uh, perhaps carry a kind of partial immunity to it. Those, those are some of the ideas around. Then there's also the matter of all this is, is colored by the kind of uneven surveillance. Uh, it's not, certainly not uh, merely a global uh, a South thing. Uh, global North also suffers the, the, the kind of uneven uh, surveillance despite uh, the, the, the country's uh, repute. Um, so, um, so, so from that, I, I would kind of like to you know, uh, continue on into a couple what I would call special topics. Uh, there's the, um, the notion of, of herd immunity. Oops, let me uh, stop the share here. And uh, just talk a little bit about herd immunity. And, and that was a lot of discussion about that. You know, if, if enough people get infected or if enough um, people got vaccinated, then we would be able to find our uh, self as a population, some safe harbor there that you we wouldn't be able to, uh, we would we would be safe from COVID from from then up there and out. Uh, Less buses group uh, in uh, late last year uh, did a study of uh, COVID antibodies and blood samples uh, in a, in a largely uncontrolled outbreak in Manaus, the, the capital of uh, uh, Amazonas state in northern Brazil, and they found there that about seventy six percent were infected by October 2020 but they hadn't achieved the kind of vaunted herd immunity, right? And there's always this number that's presented, 70%, 75%. And, um, but, uh, you know, in the, indeed also had a young population with low death rates and, but the, the outbreak there continued to march on, including in the face of kind of the non-pharmaceutical interventions that they uh, 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 undertook. And the bus's team speculated the result, maybe it's a matter of overestimating the attack rate. Maybe we're not getting hit by COVID as much as we think we are. Um, maybe the population hasn't been so infiltrated. Or maybe it's that immunity wanes and those infected are returned to the pool of susceptibles. So you just kind of keep uh, you know, returning susceptibles into the pool to be reinfected. And so in that way, the uh, outbreak continues to churn. Um, but the, I think that whatever's going on, the key lesson here, I think, to draw is that there is no magical number, you know, um, it might be different for different populations, or in fact, there may be no, no threshold at all. Um, I mean, there still would be ways to defeat the virus, right? So um, we could do a, a variety of interventions. It's what's called the Swiss cheese model of intervention. So we do vaccination and that has holes in it, but we also do the uh, uh, masking and that also has holes in it as well. And then we do all sorts of other things, the Tetris, right? Testing, um, Tetris, testing, tracing, and isolation, uh, those approaches, so that's other layers on there. So even though each layer has holes in it, if you have them all stacked up, all the holes, holes would be covered. And, you know, what's remarkable, and as we've all noted, is that the countries of the global north, for the most part, have completely abandoned that notion. They thought the vaccine is the kind of uh, a magic bullet, uh, and uh, even the very little non-pharmaceutical interventions, particularly I'm talking about Europe and uh, the North America, uh, once those uh, vaccines came about, what little non-pharmaceutical interventions were being done were abandoned. And now we see the spikes in, in England and the United States that we showed in the first map there. Um, so, you know, ostensibly, uh, even without um, herd immunity, we can very much defeat this. I mean, countries were doing it at the beginning. Uh, clearly, China, Vietnam, uh, um, New Zealand, Iceland, uh, the early days of Uruguay. Um, even without a vaccination, they were able to basically drive um, their outbreaks uh, down um, in some of those countries to, to completely uh, just about functionally without any uh, infections at that point. And uh, it really speaks, has nothing to do with this magic bullet. It has to do what you do with it, right? It has to do with governance. Uh, the decision-making that, a, that a, a government would take the, the well-being of their population as being the critical point of why they exist in, the, in, in first and foremost. That's not the case for a lot of the neoliberal uh, regimes, uh, very much about organized around uh, profit and making sure billionaires continue to be uh, um, wealthy. Um, and uh, so the damage uh, marches on. And it's, it's uh, ironic that uh, many of these countries serve as a source of the new infections, in, in, including into Africa. So uh, the tables are somewhat turned. Much of uh, Africa and Asia are often painted as the 
the dirty sources of many uh, an outbreak. But in fact, uh, here we have an example very clear. Um, and it goes back to other uh, pathogens, including uh, uh, the swine flu H1, uh, uh, H1N1 from 2009 arriving out uh, and merging out of North America. Um, but here's, you know, the notion of, of, of you know, uh, basically uh, mapping out countries as being sort of intrinsically dirty in terms of offering or being the source of multiple pathogens when, uh, in fact, uh, the world over uh, is presently in a position to, uh, in which any marginal pathogen might emerge, get on the global travel network and, and become a pandemic in, in short order. And we've seen that all during the 21st century. Every year, one, even two new uh, new uh, deadly pathogens emerged that threatened to go pandemic, often just being regional, or um, but at, the, at some point, clearly, uh, indeed, they do. And that is the what COVID-19 has certainly driven home, but it's certainly not going to be the end of it. We've had three major SARS events of deadly SARS in only 18 years, um, and it's all likelihood uh, not just out of uh, China, but elsewhere, that in all likelihood, if not coronavirus, but some of the other pathogens are likely to lead to emerge again. Um, I do want to talk a little bit also about um, about uh, the origins or or where we are with vaccination too, because I'm sure this is going to get into uh, considerable uh, topics here. And my time's running out here, so I'm going to just do a couple minutes, go through this quickly. Uh, the early days of the outbreak. Uh, WHO, even the NIH here in the United States, even the Financial Times were very much in the favor of the notion of having open medicine and making uh, vac vaccines or any uh, pharmaceuticals against COVID-19 free to all. In fact, the WHO developed the COVID-19 Technology Access Pool or CTAP. Um, but Bill Gates, uh, among others, including his buddies in the pharmaceutical industries with overwhelming influence on public health, even up through the UN executive offices, put a kibosh on those efforts. And so uh, the accelerator went down in flames and, and replaced uh, along the very much the lines of uh, the Gates uh, run accelerator, you know, along the lines of the vaccine alliance that Gates launched in, in 1999. So it's organized uh, R&D and distribution under the old model of intellectual property rights. So that includes COVAX now, which is the WHO uh, effort to distribute a vaccine to nations around the world. And uh, it's had uh, considerable impact on uh, the evolution of the virus. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, uh, when a pathogen is allowed to uh, circulate and uh, evolve, all the new variants emerge. You know, when initially we were at a, a race between uh, getting vaccines and arms around the world so we can beat the, the pathogen down uh, under its rate of replacement so that um, it's uh, uh, that in the face of it's a likelihood of the pathogen uh, evolving out from underneath the vaccine. But we, we threw that away. I mean, uh, Gates made sure that wasn't going to be the case. This is why projections are for uh, vaccines out of that program. Um, to be, you know, as late as 2024. And uh, instead, the race now is uh, more lucrative in the sense of, um, in the sense of, uh, you know, having a competition between the virus that's allowed to evolve variants and the pharmaceutical companies uh, coming up with booster shops that are quite lucrative and now are going to be priced in a way beyond the kind of pandemic pricing they've been complaining about to going from $19.50 in US dollars to $150, $175 per dose. Um, so that, that is the, the, the willingness to actually put the well-being of the uh, um, pharmaceutical companies' bottom lines and their kind of quarterly uh, profits at the expense of the world in terms of, you know, 4 million, over 4 million people have been killed by COVID-19. Uh, there are estimates of that uh, 10 times more of the, of the people have been killed uh, by COVID. Um, but uh, it, it really speaks to the profound sociopathic nature of a system uh, that puts uh, the profits of a few uh, global North companies at the expense of the health of a to the totality of humanity. Uh, I'll end with this, and that is the kind of uh, uh, kind of a representation of a kind of unequal ecological exchange that goes on. Uh, historically speaking, this is something everyone knows here. 500 years, largely. Global North uh, basically uses a Global South as both its refrigerator and its toilet, taking all the resources out and um, leaving all the damage and, and pollution there to the tune of millions of uh, 
of um, deaths uh, a year along the equator. And, um, you know, for, for the Global North has been uh, perfectly happy with that uh, arrangement uh, for a considerable time. Uh, now it's, it, that system has uh, degenerated into producing uh, what the philosophers call the hyper object, meaning uh, damage that's everywhere all at once. Climate change is an obvious example of that, but pandemics are also uh, the example as well. So clearly the, the, the step forward needs to be, we need to basically end <laughs> this kind of exploitative system. The kind of expropriation is, is on a pathway of, uh, you know, along the lines of H. Bruce Franklin's notion that, uh, you know, it's much easier to imagine the end of, uh, of the, the, or the earth than, than the end of, of, of capitalism. And uh, we, we must together combine in, in acts of global solidarity to try to get us out of such a system and to be able to uh, live in a system in which the disparities between global north and global south are, are removed, um, not only for, uh, as aspects of uh, social justice, but as a way of protecting ourselves from the damage of a sociopathic system. So I'll stop there and uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing more from people. Thank you, Rob, uh, and thank you for sticking so assiduously to time as well. It's uh, very helpful. Um, so we, we're going to move on to to our other speakers now, and uh, keep your your questions and interventions in mind because there'll be there'll be time for that um, at the end once everyone once the main speakers have, have spoken. Um, so moving on to our, our next speaker, then um, we have uh, Marley Richter, who's a, a senior researcher from Health Justice Initiative in South Africa. Um, and she has published in uh, academic and popular forums in a wide variety of areas, including law, bioethics, gender, migration, and public health. Um, yeah, so go ahead, Marlies. Thank you very much, Farai. I just want to check if you can see my uh, screen okay? Can you see yeah, my PowerPoint? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm speaking to you from, from Cape Town in South Africa. And uh, we are just moving into our third wave at the moment. Um, and the Western Cape, where Cape Town is situated, is expected to have our peak infections over the weekend. Um, what I was invited to do this, this afternoon slash evening is to, to speak a little bit about the experiences of the Treatment Action Campaign um, in their struggles for for access to medicines and to draw through some, some lessons uh, for the struggles that we uh, are all involved in around uh, COVID-19. And then just to say a few words about uh, manufacturing in, in South Africa or in, in Africa more broadly. Um, let me just see that I can move my slide along. Um, I'm from an organization called the Health Justice Initiative that's a, a newly established uh, NGO in South Africa that uh, focuses specifically on public law and health. And we use the lens of health equality um, in the work that we take on around now, very specifically COVID-19, but also around the epidemics of HIV um, and TB. When I started off as a researcher um, in the early 2000s, uh, I was a volunteer with the Treatment Action Campaign and I worked for the AIDS Law Project um, as a researcher. The AIDS Law Project became Section 27. Um, and some of the, the reflections here are around some of the, the court cases that these organizations have been involved in. Um, you might recall that, uh, that HIV especially in the early 90s um, had and continuing after that had a devastating effect on the, on the African continent, which it still does. Um, and in South Africa, uh, there was a massive explosion of, of HIV infections, um, as you can see from uh, 160,000 in 1990 um, to 4.2 million in, in 2000. And at that time, antiretrovirals had been developed, but they were completely unaffordable in Africa. ARVs cost $10,000 a year um, in 1998. Um, and what the Treatment Action Campaign and, and the AIDS Law Project did um, was to use legal advocacy, research, social mobilization, and public education uh, to shift the conversation, uh, the global conversation around drug pricing 
and making it possible for, for millions of people to, to access um, ARBs. This in South Africa has had a very material effect. South Africa now has one of the, the largest HIV treatment programs in, a world, in the world. Um, South Africa at the moment uh, has 13% of our populations living with HIV, um, which is just over 7 million people and more than two thirds of people who've been diagnosed with, with HIV um, are on treatment. Um, in terms of, of pricing in, in the intellectual property framework um, that regulates pricing, um, there was a particular focus in, in, in the struggles for, for access, uh, right of access to health, to focus on the pharmaceutical in, industry and especially how the abuse of intellectual property protections were directly leading to, to deaths um, in South Africa and, and more broadly. Uh, there was a, a case called the Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Association case uh, where a, a conglomeration of pharmaceutical, in, uh, pharmaceutical companies challenged the South African government when they passed an amendment to our, our Medicines Act that would allow for parallel importation. And the treatment action case uh, joined this case. Um, and together with, with global activists, um, there were various advocacy strategies around demonstrations around the world, uh, marching to the high court when, when the case was heard initially, uh, memorandums to the US Embassy, US uh, activists who applied a pressure uh, domestically, and uh, the PMA eventually withdrew its claims um, after this show of, of immense solidarity. Um, so this early success showed the, the value again of litigation um, and mobilization and drawing the links between health and human rights. And I think this is a history that further informed the, the TAC and other treatment uh, access groups. Um, and especially important during this time was the activist networks that were established or were strengthened during this time who would share resources, knowledge and strategies, and especially, especially to hold the pharmaceutical industry to account. And many of these networks have been reactivated again um, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, just a quick mention around keeping HIV uh, in squarely in the public eye, demonstrations uh, at international AIDS conferences, especially in, in Durban in 2000, where uh, South African activists um, and colleagues challenged uh, our president's uh, AIDS denialism uh, that was being articulated during that time. Uh, we had a, a case in 1999 against the South African government uh, specifically to implement the program of prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV. And that eventually led uh, to a court victory in our highest court. And it led to the development of a national antiretroviral program in 2004. We also used the competition law. Uh, we, we filed a complaint against GlaxoSmithKline and Bohinga Ingelheim. Uh, arguing that they violated competition law by their dominance in the market and charging excessive pricing for ARVs. This eventually uh, meant that the pharmaceutical companies had to reach a settlement in, in 2003. And that eventually led to a, a drastic cut in ARV prices. I think it's important to, to mention the World Trade Organization and the Doha Declaration, which I as, assume participants here uh, are familiar with. Um, but I just want to, to note uh, how uh, the, the, TRIPS, the TRIPS agreement and the World Trade Organization, um, how this agreement had a, a, a big impact on addressing the HIV AIDS epidemic um, and limited the, the amount of antiretrovirals that reached the global south. Um, and one, one a key advocacy point, especially from activists in the global south, was to fight for the Doha Declaration um, that focused on the public health consequences of TRIPS and provided specific safeguards. And in the Doha Declaration, there's specifically a provision on <clears throat> being able to waive some of the provisions in, in TRIPS to protect public health and to promote access to treatments for all. And this is very important within the COVID pandemic. It is very important to note, though, that some of the Doha Declaration flexibilities have never been used. And uh, 
many people and authors put it uh, to the significant pressure that especially the US exerts um, on countries not to use the TRIPS flexibilities. Uh, some are, are, are singled out and put on a watch list by the US. Um, and sometimes some of the, the provisions are, are pushed beyond what the TRIPS, favor, uh, the TRIPS uh, agreement mandates. Uh, in South Africa, we haven't really used the DAR declaration. South Africa hasn't issued one compulsory license um, in, the law, in the 20 years that the declaration has been in existence. Now to move to, to COVID, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, use some, some of the data that, that Rob might have, have mentioned already. Um, this is a, a screenshot from the WHO website from, from two days ago. Um, that showed about shows about 200 million confirmed cases of COVID, uh, just over 4 million deaths, um, and then the hope that vaccines bring to uh, to this conversation, which I think Rob has um, has spoken about in detail. I think it's important to really bring home who's getting COVID vaccines, um, and there's uh, a lot of rejoicing in the fact that that almost that just over a quarter almost a third of of the world's population has received at least one dose of of the covid vaccine that there's 15 percent who's been fully vaccinated um but yet at the same time just over one percent of people in low-income countries have received at least one dose um and the inequality in in those figures I'm going to spell out with um, with some other graphs. You can see the the very uh, pale coloring of the African continent in terms of of the people who've received at least one dose um, as of three days ago. Uh, this again is a, another uh, pictorial uh, illustration of of how the different continents measure up. In case you missed Africa on the sliver at the top, um, I'm just highlighting that. Um, and in this, yes, again, very useful graph by our world and data. If you note the, the countries right at the bottom, like the worldwide, uh, about 15% have been fully vaccinated um, with these with this um, with this data. And in comparison, some of the, the countries that are selected there, Botswana has just over 5% who's been fully vaccinated, South Africa 5%, uh, Rwanda 2%, Senegal uh, just over 1.5%, um, and then the DRC that's on, um, on 0%. Um, and I think this is shown especially around the number of vaccines administered. Uh, you can see that more than two thirds of vaccines uh, administered of the suppliers on the African continent um, and that vaccinations have, have been completed for less than 2% of the whole population um, in Africa. Uh, and this leads in South Africa, if we had to do uh, calculations about when uh, our population will reach two thirds, and I want to use the word herd immunity, this graph still talks about herd immunity, but if we want to have a position where two thirds of South Africa, South Africa, people in South Africa have been fully vaccinated, at the current rate this will still take us two years, just over two years, and I think the outlook for, for many other countries in Africa and in the global south uh, are even more dire. At, um, our organization released this data this morning um, and this goes to the, the contrast between some of the vaccines promised um, to South Africa and measuring it or contrasting it with the actual supplies that arrived on, on our shores. And you can see that we've only received about a quarter of the vaccines um, that have been promised, either through our Pfizer contract, Johnson & Johnson, uh, COVAX um, and donations by the US, US government are, are, are quite small in comparison. We had an early donation from Johnson & Johnson um, that were administered through the, the Sison Care program in which almost half a million healthcare workers um, were vaccinated. This brings me to the point of vaccine equity. 
Um, and I think there's no dispute that there's huge disparities between the global north and the global south. Um, and this led the, the World Health Organization Director General to talk about how the world is on the brink of a catastrophic moral failure and that this price will be paid by lives and livelihoods, especially in, in the world's poorest countries. And I think these words said in January 2021 um, have become more and more true as, as this year has progressed. Um, I'm going to bracket the word global herd immunity. I'm going to, to just refer to the, the number of, of people vaccinated. Uh, vaccine equity is key. Um, and it's essentially about the equitable distributions of vaccines worldwide. It makes public health sense and it makes um, it makes ethical sense uh, for vaccines to be distributed equity to the people who are the most vulnerable and who need it most before less vulnerable people are vaccinated. This brings us to, to the TRIPS waiver and specifically the, the, world, the, the global network of activists who um, are supporting uh, the waiver that, that was suggested or co-sponsored by South Africa and India in October last year and would uh, would bring about flexibilities within within trips that would make uh, the manufactured supply of vaccines and other medical goods um, would make a big impact on those. Um, and for the trips waiver to go through uh, decisions are usually taken uh, by consensus at trips. And there's been more than 100 countries that have supported uh, the trips waiver. Um, and you can see the, the distribution of, of countries that have supported the TRIPS waiver, generally along the fault lines of the global south, and countries in the global north, uh, the crosses that have blocked the TRIPS waiver going through. Um, and you can see the African continent, either co-sponsor or a sponsor of the TRIPS waiver, uh, or strongly supporting the TRIPS waiver. Uh, a conglomeration of no's in the European Union, uh, together with Norway and Australia, um, and Japan, um, importantly. And this, there's a heavy irony and a, and a big paradox that the countries who are blocking the TRIPS waiver are also the same countries who have enough vaccines to vaccinate their populations many times over. I'm drawing your attention specifically to, to Canada, who has nine times as many vaccines than they, than they need. The European Union has three and a half doses per person. This is data from January. Um, you can see the African Union there is, was at 0.2% um, at that time. But the extreme inequalities um, that is, uh, I think, depicted uh, by, uh, by preventing countries in the global south um, from uh, having COVID vaccines and, and other medical co goods available um, are particularly striking and, and heartbreaking. Um, my last point is about manufacturing in, in Africa. Uh, this was a recent announcement that a South African firm in Cape Town will be making the, the Pfizer vaccine. Um, Manufacturing is quite a, a strong word. It's basically a full and finished contract uh, that uh, is an agreement between Fi Pfizer Biotech and then the BioVac Institute in Cape Town. Um, and what is very important, while this has been lauded um, and uh, tied to the very important uh, development of, of having vaccine capacity in Africa, uh, it's important to, to take a critical look also at how um, at how this agreement has been been drafted. Uh, the agreement doesn't include the sharing of the tech or the know-how that is absolutely essential in, in manufacturing um, capacity. And uh, some of the criticism that has come from this agreement is Medicine Sans Frontiers talk about the importance of it being a first step in developing manufacturing capacity, but it's not enough to achieve vaccine uh, independence in the African continent. My colleague Fatima Hassan uh, do, speaks strongly about the issue of security of supply um, and how important it is to diversify and have local production. And to expand global manufacturing means 
uh, that manufacturers must have the freedom to produce the drug substance and to make their own production, supply and pricing decisions, not be dictated to um, by, uh, one by one pharmaceutical company, and also to make clear what this agreement says. Um, what is it? What does it entail? And why is it? Why is Pfizer reluctant to issue a full license to multiple manufacturers? Why is this only a very limited, um, full and finished contract that has um, that will that has high uh, that has high hopes? It wants to uh, produce 100 million doses annually. Uh, that they want to distribute to 54, 54 countries in, in Africa, but will only really start in 2022. So I, I want to conclude uh, by saying that, of course, manufacturing capacity in Africa is essential. Um, we have to uh, we have to develop that, especially in, in terms of future pandemics that will inevitably come. The COVAX initiative is important. Donations are great. Um, but as many of, of my colleagues say, we want change, not charity. Um, and if we start from the premise that health is a human right, like the Treatment Action Campaign clearly, um, clearly uh, personified, uh, we have to uh, we have to regard health equity and especially vaccine equity as essential in our struggles in, in the pandemic. And that means that all, all lives have to be regarded as, as being of equal value, not that lives in the global north trump those in the global south. Um, and then I, I include a couple of, uh, of readings, uh, some of the sources that I've drawn on, and especially the uh, the references to some of the, the global campaigns around the TRIPS waiver um, and, creating, uh, uh, and creating vaccine equity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marley. So that, 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 was, that was great. And would, would it be possible for you to, to share your slides? Um, With absolute pleasure. Can you do that in the chat? I will do so. Um, I put the URLs at the bottom of the graph so that you can uh, you can find updated versions because data changes so fast. I will do that in the chat right away. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to move on to our, our third speaker now. Um, our third speaker is uh, Tete um, Humeku, who's the, the head of programs at Third World Network Africa. Uh, and he has over 20 years of experience in international economic and trade policy law, negotiations and advocacy at the multilateral, regional and bilateral uh, levels. So um, Tete, if you could uh, take the stage. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, and thanks to the, to the colleagues who have spoken before me. They have uh, both made my work easier but more difficult. In a certain sense, they've covered um, both ends of the topic in terms of the um, vaccine equity, COVID, but also the manufacturing issues and, 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 and the WTO uh, law itself. What I want to do is to just basically frame some of the issues that have come up in their, in their presentations. Within the experience of African countries and their struggle over the past period to try and address the question of domestic pharmaceutical capacity. Um, to do that so that maybe interestingly, we'll, we'll be able in talking about, um, about about mobilizing support for the struggles that are going on in the BTO now, to be able to mobilize support for that, but also go beyond that, to, to go be the trips waiver, to be able to understand what the challenges that African countries have met in the process of trying to develop their own pharmaceutical capacity. But also importantly, some of the choices that they have made and the failures of those choices that we can perform. Um, the concept note that was given for this uh, seminar, I'm going to focus on two things that I think are interrelated that frame the situation of African countries in relation to, to, to the vaccine situation that we have. One, of course, is the fact that the, the vaccine process is dominated by the global transnational corporations based in the advanced industrial countries and supported by their governments. And that is something that we've said everybody knows. It's something that we have been fighting about for the, over, over many, many years. But equally critical is a point that has been made about the fact that related to this is the weak, um, almost non-existent domestic pharmaceutical capacity. 
And the sense that even as African countries are caught within the same bias as, as the international system, other countries like Cuba and Cuba have money to go forward. Now, I'd like to explore the contradictions involved in this thing in the way that allow us to share some light of what the, uh, the, the struggles have been. Of course, the, my, the colleagues have already talked about the trips waiver that is going on now, the trips waiver and the struggles around it. The fact that um, the countries of the North um, are widely ranked against the countries of the South Africa and other developing countries around this trips waiver thing is just an explicit um, clear, clear example about just the extent to which the advanced countries and their transnational corporations would like to hold on to their place in the international order, which uh, Africa is missing. But however intense the struggles around the trips ever have been, we have to remember that this is not the first time, in fact, that, that this big fight is taking place in the WTO about the trips. Um, uh, uh, the colleague that spoke before me, I'm sorry if I, I don't catch your name very well, has already referred to the Doha Declaration. Almost 10 years ago, the African countries and other developing countries confronted the same group of players in the North over, you know, far, you know adding flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement so that African countries can address another health crisis caused this time by the TRIPS agreement. And in fact, it's arguable that the intensity of the struggle that we have today is because of the failures and disappointments that came after that TRIPS waiver. Now, I'll come to look at all that a bit later, um, and just pick up on some of the things that um, Malis has talked about. But I like to, to um, look within this context about just how African countries have tried to, to address this, what I'm calling the pharmaceutical capacity in Africa and, and, and how, what has happened. Because this struggle that started from, the, from Doha to now is not new, it has been going on in different forms. African countries have tried to take the initiative to address their vaccine deficits or pharmaceutical deficit. International companies have intervened in different ways and they're supported by, the, by their own countries. Notice that I'm using the word here or the phrase domestic pharmaceutical capacity. And I, I distinguish that in two ways from a narrow situation in which a subsidiary of a, an international company just size a local production in, a, in an African country without, I can see that, I hear that my internet is unstable, but you know, bear with me, without it affecting the totality of the productive culture of the country. And, and more importantly, to talk about pharmaceutical capacity beyond simply vaccines, because vaccines are important, but really they're just one of the elements of the totality of the capacity of African countries to address the range of pharmaceutical needs that they have. And I'm using the word domestic, again, rather than local, to give the sense that Domestic combines both the local character of, of, of routine production, but more importantly, the fact that it is embedded in the totality of the nations and its imperatives, its challenges, its people and drives, uh, and, and what can be done about it. And domestic here also, in the context of Africa, is not simply within nations, but both regional and continental. Now, I like to tell my story, my, my thing through a number of stories, and as a Ghanaian, I like to, to start this story by three co uh, mo a moment of coincidence that brought together three things which explain very much so the situation that we have in vaccine, the history of their struggles to develop vaccine capacity, or sorry, pharmaceutical capacity, where we are now, the deficit that we have. Uh, on the 24th of February this year, we Ghanaians woke up to the, to the very joyful news that we were the first country which have been given COVAX vaccines. Uh, and many people were quite happy. Uh, we, were we were qualified for COVAX vaccines. Now, as you know now, um, six months later, um, it has not turned out as hopeful as it has been because even though a few people have been vaccinated, the total majority of the people in the country have not been vaccinated. So all you have to do is to get out of Accra, the people in the villages, outside the cities, have never even sniffed any vaccine. It's, in, it's interesting that if it had been for the fact that the Congo DR um, uh, um, was a bit tardy in applying its dose of vaccines, Ghana would have struggled to have a second dose of the vaccinations. But it's part of whatever has happened. The reason why the 24th February is important 
was that 24 February was also the date in which was the anniversary when Kwame Nkrumah, the, found, the man who led Ghana's independence, was overthrown. Uh, and in the coup that um, we all know was inspired partly by the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. The important thing of that ironic twist of adversary was that almost just six months before Nkrumah was overthrown, his government had established a state pharmaceutical enterprise um, with almost all the facilities to try and address the, the, the problems that we, we, uh, we they face at colonialism. Immediately after the coup d'etat, one of the things that the, gov the government that took over from Nkrumah did was actually to try and hand over that state enterprise to a foreign pharmaceutical uh, multinational, which was Abbott Laboratories from, uh, from the United States. Uh, it said on, on, on a sector that was so outrageous, it generated a very great backlash from across the, the, the generality of Ghanaian population, which led uh, to, to the abandonment, more or less, handing over the thing to, to, um, to Abbott Laboratories from, from the USA. Now, I'll come and look at what happened subsequently. But the third leg of the, of the coincidence that I already am talking about is that in the same week which we were celebrating the overthrow of Nkrumah, the same day that we were celebrating receiving COVAX vaccines, the Ghana government was also in conversations with the Cuban government to try and generate some kind of relationships for Cuba to support us with um, uh, transport technology in terms of pharmaceutical capacity. Now, the irony, of course, is that the Nkrumah Initiative in 1965, that was uh, almost threatened by the coup makers, was coming at the same time as Cuba and Castro's own investment in, in, in medicinal and pharmaceutical capacity. That was running uninterrupted until today and I generated the kind of benefits that we have. Let us explore these three elements and see what, what lessons we have with it. Now, Nkrumah, of course, was not the only person who was trying to, and his government, one of the only person, only government in Africa which was trying to establish pharmaceutical capacity and production capacity on the continent. It was something that was done all over the place for Nasser, Egypt, Nigeria, Senegal, and co. The, the important thing is that this uh, government was reacting against the situation that they had inherited from colonialism. Now, if we know that the um, um, colonial um, sorry, I, I hope my internet is, is back on because I keep on getting the messages that my internet is unstable. So forgive me if you don't have that come across. What Nkrumah was addressing together with his colleagues was to try and meet this, the particular problem that colonialism created in terms of domestic capacity in African continent. We know that African countries in terms of industrialization were basically just producing raw materials and consuming products, manufactured products. In the case of pharmaceutical, it was even worse. Um, as some scholars you know, said, in fact, some of the critical elements of the production of knowledge and science and development in local knowledge was deliberately stopped by the colonial authorities. And African countries became basically just the, the harvesting ground of herbs and herbal products that were then taken and experimented on, and then were given the, if lucky, the end products. What Nkrumah's policy tried to do was to intervene at three levels. Intervene at the level of just a factory with the capacities and technology, technology machinery and things to be able to participate in the production of, of pharmaceutical products. That's the first thing. But Nkrumah was very clear that it was not enough simply to have a factory in your country. That factory must also be linked into the process of generating and building knowledge the front, building the frontiers of knowledge. So there's a certain linkage between the pharmaceutical company and the totality of building our universities, linking them to scholars, scientific production, etc. And equally importantly was the idea that whatever the limits that Ghana and other African countries had, they also had the source of medicinal knowledge in terms of our herbs, our products, which was an important link that was being built. Now, this totality of Lincoln was therefore supposed to, was, was an intervention that is supposed to win African countries and Ghana definitely from the kind of stranglehold that they inherited from colonialism. Now, the, as I said, the attempt by the post coup government to hand over the whole thing to this factory to foreign transnational corporations did not succeed. And so the 
this enterprise continued in the certain form and it continued to produce um, products for the Ghanaian market, especially for the public sector on the structural adjustment period collapsed it. But it's important to notice three things which are important for the success and the longevity of that. One was the fact that the government strongly intervened to make sure that the pharmaceutical production was linked to public procurement and public policy. So um, the market for the products that were going to be produced, um, the market for the products were already guaranteed in terms of public hospitals, the army institutions, which are supposed to be taken up. So that's the first thing. Secondly, it was important that the government intervened to ensure that some list of um, uh, medical products could not be imported into the country, right? And they're listed. And up to today, there's various remnants of that list of products that are not allowed to be imported into the country. But third, and more importantly, see, we are going to talk, talking about intellectual property, was the fact that the government in that time, in 1972, uh, passed a law that abrogated all patents on medical products which were in existence at that time. So that all the patents that were given for medical products were just abrogated and prohibited from you know, entering new products in the future. Now, this totality of, of, um, of intervention were important for creating both the legal and the scientific and material conditions, the economic conditions within which that conflict thrived onto the structural adjustment period. The other things that supported that go, uh, company was also the fact that it was linked to other elements and sectors of the economy. So for instance, to the point that even in importing these raw materials where it has to import, you use the, the state shipping lines. So you relied on the shipping lines to get its products rather than use other private multinational shipping lines or it goes money from the bank and things like that. Nevertheless, it's, it's arguable that the kind of comprehensive vision that Nkuma had for intervening the pharmaceutical sector were fragmented because the, the government vision that led to the establishment of that, that enterprise was attenuated once it comes out of power. Now, as I said, with, with structural adjustment and neoliberalism, uh, through a series of privatization, um, the government now focusing on price mechanisms, lack of government support. First of all, that, that company was privatized and then later on, basically it was not able to compete within the context that it was competing anymore. Now, let me then take this example and then on the basis of that, just ask the question about the, the role of intellectual property in this kind of struggle between uh, an attempt to build domestic capacity and what has happened since structural adjustment about it. Before I do that, though, I must make the point that one of the successful, uh, one of the indications of the success was that the, 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 the place or the state enterprise that was generated was, was that it was able to generate um, a, a situation where it could bargain with multinational companies in different terms at that time. In fact, the multinational companies found, found a need to enter into different agreements so that they will give some of their products for the local company to make. Um, there are debates about whether that was ultimately healthy or not, but it was a kind of terms of engagement and negotiation which is not available now, where the, from, uh, the, from, uh, the transnational corporate are dictating what should we produce where, as the example that um, Malaysia just gave in South Africa shows. So what, what is the, what's the role of intellectual property in this? And what does it say about the struggles that are going on in the trips we have now and the way forward after that? As I said, one of the important things in this company's history that I was talking about was the ability of the Ghana government in 1972 to banish, take out, eh, legislate against existing patents that were granted to foreign companies of medical products in the country and to prohibit the federal grant of that. Now, that just talks about the kind of intellectual property regime that was in place before the WTO. An intellectual property regime that even though it um, replicated the mimics of the standards of in the North, still gave space for different countries and different companies to treat, um, the, the, devote their own law and legislative framework in relation to intellectual property for, for the production of public health. TRIPS, however, has changed the situation, as we know. And rather than going to deep, what TRIPS has done was to reinforce the monopoly of the big transnational corporations 
in the all the elements that are needed for medical medicinal products in a way that was not available before trips. So the the the, the strength monopoly that we are talking about today is something that trips inaugurated in a fierce reduced bow. The other side, so it means that Africans' access to uh, the products for pharmacies have been curtailed very brutally. It's part of the different different flexibilities that are there that if the country was determined, they can use. The other side of it, though, is that the paradigm of trips also enabled a continued what I call biopiracy. In other words, even while it was making it difficult trips for Africans to have access to the uh, to the technology or the multinational corporations, it was still open for people to come to Ghana to go to different parts of India and take the the whole um, traditional knowledge in health, take it back and patent it for themselves. And there have been a lot of struggle from WR Grace in India to even cases in Ghana where that biopiracy and attempt have been challenged but have not been very successful. There's a time in the 1990s when um, there was an attempt in the Organization of African U Unity at that time to try and develop what we call an African model law to enable us to fight against biopiracy. But Africans unfortunately did not you know, stand behind that thing in terms of successful. So, so what we are fighting now under the TRIPS agreement is basically this, this dual situation, which first of all, they monopolize the technology, but also at the same time, has open to appropriate our resources for themselves. Now, I, I don't want to go into more details because in fact, Melissa has said a number of things about the TRIPS waiver. In a certain sense, you know, as she said already, it, is, it, it goes beyond what was fought over in Doha. And now instead of simply patents, it goes to a whole range of intellectual property rights, copyright, industrial designs, many things that are important for making medicine in the modern context. Simply because also the technologies are shifted, you know, 3D and all those things have come into making medicine. So that's not shifted. We also have heard about the different mythological arguments that the countries in the North, Europe and the USA until now, in fact, USA even now, uh, have deployed in an attempt to, to, to to resist the, the waiver that has been given, uh, that the waiver that has been asked for. Ideas that uh, if you give the waiver, it will collapse innovation, or there's nothing to do with trips, and et cetera. I, mean, I think the examples are many, and we can go into them details. What I, I want to I emphasize, though, is that it is important for all of us to support this struggle to get the waiver, because it's an important starting point um, for, 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 for building domestic from a state capacity. Um, in fact, everybody acknowledges that's an important point. But nobody, nobody who has been asking the was sees it as a silver bullet. In fact, India and South Africa, who are in the lead and all the sponsors are not saying that we'll get trips waiver, all the problems about pharmaceutical capacity in Africa will be solved. It's an important starting point. If it's an important starting point, then, then what are the things that we progressive should be looking forward and fighting for to strengthen? that will go beyond that starting point to the future. Because as I said, um, and as uh, Melissa said, we have been here before. When the Doha Declaration on Trips and Public Health was adopted, no many African countries even made in use of that, of that facility. It is true that many, many countries came under pressure from the European Union and America and so that they couldn't use it. Uh, what is worse, um, they, they put limits on it, you know, re-entrench the trip, trips in other agreements like you know, economic partnership agreement, et cetera, and uh, freedom agreements, AGOA, and things that, that made it difficult for many African countries to use it. But it's also true though, that only a few countries even made attempt to amend their domestic legislation, right? To take cognizance of the flex sleep for the flexibilities uh, in Africa. So only a few countries actually went ahead and adopted domestic trips law, or intellectual property law, to make sure that the, the, the flexibility that were offered was taken care of. What is even more so, the, the whole process in which African countries could have built relations among themselves, yeah, among themselves to be able to take advantage of what's not taken care of. So, so there, there's a point to be, we have to reflect on, it, on, on, on what African countries did after that. And in my view, it has to do both with the pressure that African countries face, but more importantly, the strategic choices that African countries make and continue to make. 
And let me just conclude this presentation because I have two more minutes by giving an example of that strategic choice that I'm talking about. At the moment, African countries outraged as we all are, are not talking about you know, building local production capacity, trying to establish relationships and networks to do capacity. We are campaigning doing many things. It's interesting though, and this is an interesting thing, that Cuba has, is one of the countries in the South that has developed its own domestic vaccine. Now, while African countries were going around and putting money to, to put into things to buy things, it never crossed anybody's mind that actually, when Cuba was trying to do its phase three trial, it was, it was cash trap. Phase three trials are not cheap, they're expensive, or vaccine trials are expensive. If the African countries have thought about putting it, each of them putting 20 million or even 15 million each into Cuba and say, listen, we will support your phase three trial in exchange for a much more consistent relationship to exchange technology to build a capacity. That will have been a certain South-South relationship that we have been thinking about, right? And in fact, it's, 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 it's interesting that nobody thought about it, given especially that Cuba has played a certain role in promoting health in Africa, has sent doctors to Africa, has sent many, many things, our hospitals, our things are full of you know, Cuban doctors. And yet, we are putting more resources to have a relationship with either Pfizer or BioNTech or something like that. Now, what I'm suggesting is that a, a choice which makes Africans look not simply to themselves, but also a much more important South-South collaboration will be an important way forward to how we address the, the choice that we face now. Of course, it's also, it also goes without saying that South-South cooperation also required other partners in the South to cooperate. Um, China is building facilities in, in, um, in Argentina and Co, but it seems to me that the comprehensiveness of the, of the kind of transfer technology relationship that could be built at the moment is not available here from what China is doing. But it's a conversation that African countries must lead, as it were, with their South partners. They must lead it by formulating a strategy of intervention that goes beyond thinking and thinking around the edges. Otherwise, we will return again, maybe under pandemic time, to campaign the same campaign that we are having. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tete. Um, okay, so uh, now we have um, we have some shorter interventions from from activists, just to uh, just to, um, to to give a perspective from from where they are. Um, so I. I think these are these are just five minutes. Uh, I think we have we have time for two before we open it up to the audience. Uh, so let's uh, start off with uh, with the Sheikh uh, Didiane um, Dia, who's uh, going to talk to us about uh, Senegal. So Sheikh, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for uh, to all the organizers for inviting me to this discussion and. Um, I've been asked to talk about the Senegalese uh, case in five minutes. I will do it very uh, briefly. Uh, uh, like uh, all other countries, Senegal has been uh, facing the COVID-19 health uh, crisis since last year in March, when the first case of COVID uh, was discovered in the country. Uh, and since then, the government of Senegal has put in place um, several measures to, to contain, to try to contain the spread of the, of the disease. And these measures uh, include uh, curfews, um, banning of gathering in public places, um, restriction of travels in between cities and so on. And there are some other measures. But unlike some, most of the countries in, um, in the North and some African countries like Morocco, I think Nigeria or South Africa also, and some other countries, Senegal has never applied containment because um, the, uh, the, 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 uh, it was known by the government that uh, it, would be it would have been difficult to manage that containment uh, because the, the economic conditions of the population, uh, nearly 80% uh, of whom were, are engaged on um, informal activities are not very, really uh, suitable for containment. That's why the government did not uh, try that that measure, and the first wave of uh, pandemic was relatively uh, uh, low intensity in Senegal. Uh, we can say that because in July last year, 2020, the Senegal had just uh, 
Can I say just because cases are, but we had uh, 9,805 confirmed cases and one, 195 deaths last year in July. But one year later, this year in July, next one, exactly one year after, um, the number of confirmed cases had risen to 63,560 uh, and, and, and uh, cases, confirmed cases for 1,365 deaths uh, one year after. And this means that the number of deaths uh, has multiplied by six in the country in one year. And this is something very complicated for, for Senegal because the country, the government, the structure, sanitary structure was not uh, prepared to have this kind of uh, rising of the, of the, uh, the COVID-19 here. And today it is a Delta variant that caused more death in the country. It seemed to be more contagious because we have, and for example, a few days ago, uh, we had the highest level of number of deaths in one day, which was 29. And uh, as for the vaccination campaign, it was launched in February this year after the receipt of the first 200,000 doses um, uh, of vaccine from China, which was from Sinopharms. And the governor wanted to start the vaccination with the um, people, Senegalese over 60 years and those working, uh, living with comorbidities and some chronic diseases and so on, and also the, the health personnel. And after that first dose of Sinopharm, the country received also uh, for donation from COVAX, um, something like 300,024 dose of AstraZeneca in March this year, followed by another uh, 100,108 100,000 uh, 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 dose of in, in this year, April, and more recently in this month of July, 600,000 of doses uh, from part of them uh, are from Sinopharm and the other part from uh, Johnson. And in total, the Senegal uh, received a total of 1.2 million of uh, doses of vaccine. And 1.8% of the population is now fully vaccinated, which is very, very low. And 3.6 have received the first dose of, of vaccine. And one of the challenges uh, related to vaccination is the problem of, of access or, uh, to this vaccine, of course. The lacking of necessary financial resources uh, because the country does not have the, the means to, to buy and it's only waiting uh, of donations from COVID initiative. For instance, some people have already received the first dose, but they are waiting for some more donation to be able to, to have the second dose, which is something very complicated because if uh, the, uh, we don't receive those doses in time, perhaps the first dose that, that they have taken would not have effect on them. And, um, the, 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 the reason of this is that also it's not only access to vaccine, but we, we should recognize that part of the population is still reluctant to, to receive vaccines. And uh, campaigns by the government and NGOs is not really changing the situation. Most of the people are saying that they would not be uh, accept to be vaccinated because of the, some uh, effects or consequences of those vaccines. And, uh, the, the main thing that I want to, to say before ending is that uh, as the government has, not, is now, uh, uh, has recognized or is now seeing like the other government that COVID is here and perhaps it will be here for a long period, the government have uh, decided to, to create a kind of structural solution by gaining uh, sovereignty on, uh, on vaccines. And that's why a uh, 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 vaccine production industry is uh, now being uh, 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 created here in Dakar. Uh, and it is a project which is financed by World Bank, some European countries and United States. And the, the factory is expected to produce 300 million doses per year. 
And uh, firstly, vaccines against COVID would be produced. And then after COVID, we hope that COVID will end uh, very uh, soon. After COVID, those, that um, company would continue producing other types of vaccines against uh, endemic diseases. And this project will be implemented by uh, Pasteur Institute, Institute Pasteur, which is based here in Dakar, and which already produced the yellow fever vaccine here. So the country has some, some experience in producing vaccines with uh, uh, Institute Pasteur in Dakar. And this is an experience that the government want to use to be able also to produce uh, the, the COVID vaccine. So the production will be from Senegal, of course, but also for West Africa and also for uh, some other African countries uh, for COVID and later on for the other diseases. So that's what I wanted to share with you in the Senegalese situation. And I am open for, uh, um, for uh, questions and clarifications if they uh, need be. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor. Thank you, Sheikh. And then finally, uh, I'm not sure if my, my colleague uh, Juki is, is there, but I, I think he was going to speak on Kenya as well. So Juki, are you, are you, uh, are you available? Hello, yeah, hello. Hi, go ahead, Hi. Juki. Um, uh, let me try to put my video. I always having sometimes a video. No. Aha. Uh -huh. I think my video has got some challenges, but I hope I'm being heard. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Farai is the chair of this session for, for such an elaborate and uh, good sharing of this session. I will, uh, I will, I will give some, some, some few, uh, some few realities from my country, Kenya. Uh, not that really I'm an expert in this area, uh, but, uh, uh, and of course, the short time of looking for an expert in this area. Uh, was difficult but hopefully that in the next session there will be there will be better experts from Kenya who will try to give the realities of COVID-19 properly. Uh, I will start with three, three I will uh, share you three, thing, three things. One of them is to talk about uh, the current realities uh, within the five minutes I'll be given but the second thing I'll talk about the, the efforts being done by various players and the third thing I will give about my observation and maybe prospects uh, that I'll hear within the the COVID-19 menace. And uh, just to say what has been done by colleagues from Senegal and, and, and Ghana is that the reality is uh, the numbers keep uh, rising and increasing. Uh, for example, like now we we have almost about uh, about two, over 2,000 uh, infections since it began last year. Uh, we have about uh, 4,000 uh, deaths as per yesterday. Uh, it was, it, and these deaths have really short within what is being referred to as the data variants, uh, which is seen to be more lethal and, and, and contagious and spreading much more. And uh, it is devastating uh, people, uh, but now even much more than before, this is devastating much more even the, 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 the rebelling classes, the lower classes that we, we, we thought initially uh, were not getting infected as, as before. Uh, the, the, the reality is also now that COVID-19 is becoming not, the statistics statistics of COVID-19 are no longer uh, the way that we are seeing them as distant. Uh, we are seeing them now as, as, as much more with us. Uh, we are seeing them that they, 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 they are close relatives, they are neighbors and they are friends. Uh, so we have statistics now close to us, unlike before when they were so distant. And, uh, and, and, and remote from us. Uh, but now the, the third point is about the, the, the vaccination. So far, Kenya has received almost about uh, 1.7, 1 1.8 million doses. Uh, and uh, it's about 1.7% of Kenyans have been vaccinated. Uh, we are projecting, this is projected that if the, the rate goes of vaccination to this country at such low rate uh, it will almost take uh, almost two years and over for 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 all the Kenyans uh, to be vaccinated. Uh, of course, the, in my opinion, is that the, the 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 vaccination wherever you are receiving it, they are still being received from the northern countries, uh, UK, America, and others. To me, this still compounds the the the, the, the ideas that of, of donations 
uh, charity, uh, unlike what we always talk about in terms of solidarity. So it was almost taken like a way of, of donations, of sympathy to, to the country when we receive this kind of, uh, of, of vaccinations. And actually it is still continuing with the what I'm seeing, a variety of the Cold War, where we are not taking lessons from countries like Cuba or even China itself. Actually, EJ is now verified because we are being told by all the mainstream media and elsewhere that they refused the doses that were supposed to, to come from a serum institute. There's a lot of biases completely coming to vaccinations and the whole question of the Cold War and the politics which goes with imperialism. Uh, so there's all that that is coming up. Uh, but um, the, my observation is also that uh, the, 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 there is also a very, very class issue within the administration of, of, of Vax DC. Uh, the local clinics where the persons and the other people go here in the neighborhood, they are depleted very easily. There are small doses coming to small dispensaries and clinics in the country. And there is long queues for those people who want to have those vaccines, but they don't get them and they get depleted very easily. Whereas you go to private and big hospitals, uh, mainly part private hospitals, you'll get some, 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 some of them uh, but it's still is accessibility is, is, is difficult uh, to be to know where they are it's still difficult so you find that the majority of the population completely uh, even within the so-called frontline workers they, they are still not vaccinated uh, in this country we are told that for example the schools have opened last week but even within the frontline workers the teacher themselves is almost about uh, almost about 60 percent of teachers exactly who have been vaccinated and the others uh, have not been vaccinated and these are the teachers completely who will be able to to, to work with our children and and continue uh, with them with, with 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 the campaign against COVID-19. Of course the 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 there is a whole there is a whole uh, optimism that there is new vaccine that they, the, the vaccines have been coming on there's widespread information which is already in the country that there are more vaccines which are becoming on the varieties even from Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson. There are many others on infantry which is coming, but are still accessibility and knowledge of what to do and where to go is still not being done very well. Uh, the, the coping with COVID-19 is not being taken seriously like a priority within uh, the, polit the politicians and other elite group. It's still seen like, like, a, like a by the way, uh, and then there is a misinformation still, and also there is a lot of misinformation and superstitions uh, which are coming up with uh, the COVID-19 COVID vaccine, which are definitely need to be debunked even from the, the, the older people, but also from the, the front-end workers. So the seal campaign goes on, and I think this, 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 this will, will, will settle so much once we continue doing uh, an analysis of the imbalance in terms of uh, the campaigns and the vaccination. So that it doesn't continue with the same kind of prejudices and aspects of imperialism that you have had all over the years in Africa and the rest of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Farai. Thank you, Juki. Uh, and, and thanks to all our speakers. Uh, I'd, I'd now invite um, the people in the audience to, if, they, if you have um, either questions for our speakers or, or interventions to make, um, I think Mar Marlies has had to leave uh, due to childcare responsibilities, but the rest of the speakers are still here uh, and they can respond to your questions. Or if you have interventions, um, please raise your hand um, or you can put questions in the chat as well. Um, and yes, our, our speakers can, can respond. Uh, I know we've, we've already had some people speaking in the chat, but if anyone wishes to, uh, wishes to speak. Okay, we, we have... Uh, we have one here uh, from uh, Noble, Noble. So please, please go ahead. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. So I'm calling in from Accra, Ghana. Um, concerning Mr. Tete's last point on the solidarity that African countries can form with Cuba, you know, in developing domestic um, capacity, pharmaceutical capacity, um, and specifically with regards to supporting phase three trials, I know somewhere in February, Mexico, I know I, I was in negotiations with Cuba to host part of the phase three trials in Mexico. You know, that is the sort of solidarity or cooperation that can be encouraged in Africa as well. But Mexico 
was in a dire situation because you know things COVID was getting out of hand there. But then also, I think Mexico institutionally, in terms of you know it met its medical regulator, would have been able to take care of an of a situation like that or host phase three trials because it has very strong um, local regulator in terms of pharmaceuticals. So the question I want to ask is, do you think in terms of building the institutional capacity to be able to form phase three trial solidarity, for example, with Cuba, you know, do you think we have the institutional capacity or, you know, in terms of finance, don't you think what was African countries trying to do was, you know, secure um, finance, uh, use the, the limited amount of money they have to get, you know, the available vaccines rather than going through the long process of supporting phase three trials, we may not turn out to be successful. You know, I think, you know, um, Mexico, for example, was working on a lot of legs, procuring at the same time, you know, helping um, host phase three trials. Do you think institutionally African countries will be ready to do that or are, are in the position to do that? Um, it's my question. If you can explore that a little bit. I mean, what were the roadblocks? Why couldn't we you know, do those phase three collaborations or solidarity with Cuba. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tese, would you like to respond to that? And, and then in, in the meantime, people can, uh, can put over their hands if they have questions. Okay, no, thanks. Thanks a lot, Noble. Um, um, and, and, and I mean, I take the point you're making that, that um, the suggestion that Ghana, sorry, African countries who have supported Cuba in their phase three trial uh, require a number of conditions that have to be met. Um, but the point that I'm making is not actually that um, that it was, okay, let, let me put this, I, I was making a, a point of strategy that the African countries were, 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 were doing many, many, many things to, to try and, and secure vaccines to themselves. Um, but the a strategic vision will have said that, look, here is a friendly country which has reached out to us in many, many ways that we are working with supply doctors to us. So in terms of developing even medium to long-term vaccine capacity, why don't we collaborate? And I'm suggesting that, um, that, that, that I give the example of just putting money uh, into Cuba's phase three trial because Cuba at that point of course, was a point where Cuba was struggling because as we all know, the question of uh, phase three trial is not cheap. And now many countries were waiting for Cuba to finish its phase three trial so that they can also have access to its medicine. I mean, it will have been much more strategic if they have said that, look, let us have a bargain and see how this phase three trial of yours will take. Um, there's nothing, there's nothing, nothing any more risky in doing that with Cuba than many other countries did when they put money available to buy so a vaccine from suppliers who never tend not to come because the, the countries which were where the manufacturers were decided to practice vaccine nationalism. So simply, I'll just say, making the point of a strategic interaction, kind of a, a foresight. The question of institutional capacity is something that could also have been put into the point, because what I'm looking at is how could African countries, what kind of relationships can they build to be able to take advantage of whatever they will get, for instance, if their trips and trips waiver proposal succeeds, right? Where would they go? Would they, um, are we going to, I would like you to get back the situation that we had, for instance, after the Doha recovery integration where they succeeded, but we're not able, able to even to take advantage of the situation that we had. Indeed, it's also agreeable, as many, many scholars have pointed out, that even at the moment, there are a number of flexibilities anyway, their trips from existing national security possibilities and things like that. that if there's a, a comprehensive strategy, it is possible for African countries to begin to take advantage of some of those things, even if they keep away uh, the you know, the So basically, Noble, I, I recognize the points we are making, but the suggestion that I'm making is that African countries could actually make better strategic choices, right? Uh, than, than simply constantly, you know, applying their trade with the countries in the North, which as we have known, are driven by a number of political economy to put their own countries and their companies first. Um, but as I also point out, South-South cooperation is not a one-way street. So beyond Cuba, who else is there? Uh, China, India, how willing are they to get into that kind of South-South cooperation that um, um, could, could lead to proper transfer technology? And in fact, what we are talking about now leads to the whole question about revisiting 
um, the old, the spirit of Bandung, the non alive movement and things like that. You know, what we are facing now requires some radical transformation, but the radical transformation requires thinking in different strategic terms than we are doing now. Okay, uh, thank you, Teje. Um, so we we have we have a comment from the uh, in the chat um, from from Horace, and it says uh, a non a non profit pharmaceutical manufacturing capacity is needed for Africa and to be tackled by the the African Union. The manpower is definitely around, and what is need, needed is the funding to start this. I thought it might might be interesting for for our, our speakers um, to address you know particularly the the, the question of the African Union. Um, because you know, Tete was talking about um, domestic capacity um, or South-South co cooperation, but I wonder, you know, is is there a role for organisations like the African Union, or are they just kind of adjuncts to you know to to the pharmaceutical industry or to the kind of the forces of international development which are which are hindering rather than helping um, uh, Africa in, in the, the pursuit of uh, of tackling COVID nineteen. So I don't know if any of our speakers would like to, to think about that. Um, if I may. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Since, since you mentioned my name. Yeah, definitely, as I said, for me, I start with the conception that domestic pharmaceutical capacity is not simply based in nations, right? So it's, it, it's, not, it's not sufficient for Ghana to build its capacity on itself. It can't. It will be better if it's doing it regionally. You know, for example, with regional cooperation. So what can Ghana do with Nigeria or what can Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa do and all that thing. And therefore there's a place, it's a regional strategy, um, a continent-wide strategy. So there's a place in that for the African Union and the African institutions, the intergovernmental institutions, which can be seen as motors. Um, I return the question that is important for them to see that as a strategic African initiative cooperating among themselves. And, 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 and that is the starting point. The question of finance that has come up, usually it comes up in all manner of ways. And so I think that the comment, the man who made the comment is right. Uh, you, can, you have to finance most of these things. But actually, um, finance, depending on how we approach it, is not actually as, um, as a forbidden obstacle as it is. Because the starting point is the, the capacity of the state to generate resources, domestic resources, through all manner of forms to be able to meet its needs, right? Um, and, the, and, the, and the African government, governments are also states that can generate their resources. They have, we have given up many, many sources of our, you know, of, of, of finance, all the way from our, our control of well, illicit financial flows, taxation, all the way to just what we do our international trade duties and taxation, what you have done to them. But more importantly, for the fact that to be able to leverage national institutions and national banks, create national facilities to support uh, initiatives like that, it is possible if we put our mind to it. So, so it seems to me that the starting point is just strategically understand that building domestic pharmaceutical capacity in Africa is, is, an, is both nation to nation and regional integration project, which must support it as it were, financially. Unfortunately, in Africa, we tend to, to, to go the other way around. And, and this is a problem because, you see, to give two, two examples of how Africans are going about their things, I, I was reading quite recently that uh, many Afri African leaders are quite excited that, in fact, in, in, in building this, uh, in, in, in moving to build local production, the ACFTA will help them to do that. Now, as I, I had occasion to argue that, actually, the kind of policy collaboration and policy relationship that is needed to build pharmaceutical industry and capacity in Africa is not the, uh, the kind of what is, uh, is made, being made possible through the ACFT because the ACFT simply has a paradigm that just create a big market. And after you've created a big market, it will encourage the private sector to behave and work. Unfortunately, we know that that doesn't really work. Uh, if you look at the very history of the negotiation of the ACFT itself, it can give you a bit of a, a moment to pause because for a long time, when the Africans were negotiating their own SCFTA, they were not even putting money in their own secretariats, which were negotiating the SCFTA. They were looking for foreign donors to support them in the negotiation of the SCFTA. Now, if the attitude continues, then, then the kind of the situation, that, uh, the ability to raise resources to support our development of pharmacies is not likely to happen. So 
is both a paradigm shift and the, the knowledge acknowledgement that the African state is capable of generating resources and that, and that generating resources is not necessarily to bring a quantum of money and put it down, but there are many, many ways in which you can generate resources to meet your needs. Okay, thank you. And we do we have a here's yeah, a question from from Johnny. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I think you're you're still on on mute. It seems to me. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh -huh. It seems to me that uh, the question of uh, the vaccine in uh, many African countries is not just a, a, a technical problem, but an important problem of part and parcel of the political will that African nations have. Note, as we know today, vaccine imperialism or whatever we want to call it, falls directly into the current uh, geopolitical context. The moment other countries, apart from the Western ones, talk about vaccine, the first thing you hear many so-called experts in Africa mouthing off is that, why are we going to take the Chinese vaccine when the European Union has not approved it? Why are we going to take the Russian vaccine when this has not been approved by the European Union? You can hear African countries talk about things like that. It is a matter of them falling directly behind their colonial masters, both in terms of the vaccine and everything else that has to do with the political economy that they are engaged in. It's not purely a matter of uh, technical ability or otherwise. They're not even thinking in those directions quite yet. African countries are currently constituted, even within the AU, apart from very, very few ones are actively, not just negative, they're actively part and parcel of the uh, self-negation that their role as neo-colonists neo impose on them. So we have to see this whole vaccine thing not as separate from any of the other elements that they are currently engaged in, but as a continuation of their continuing reliability uh, on their colonial masters to tell them what to do. So long as the British, the Americans and so on have not yet approved any dimensions of uh, uh, the African nations going this way or that way, they will remain the way they are. And I was not surprised at all to hear so-called experts in Ghana talking about the fact that they have, there's no approvement, the, approve, uh, the European Union has not approved something, and therefore they in, are not in a position to approve or be engaged in. So you can see, for example, today in Ghana, for example, has no interest in going with the uh, Russian COVID vaccination or Cuban ones for that matter, but they are perfectly willing to be part of the overall uh, anti uh, uh, other propaganda of this thing. So they get involved in things like trying to import Russian vaccine through third parties and so on, but have no intention at all in actually using them. So it seems to me that the fundamental issues continue, both in the area of uh, vaccine imperialism and elsewhere. And for that matter, the more fundamental questions uh, have to be resolved before we are able to move ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your intervention, Johnny. And uh, we have a couple more hands. So can uh, can we have Anita first, please? Yes, thank you, Anita Naya. Um, I just wanted to pick up on two points. Uh, Marlies had mentioned that the flexibilities of the Doha trips uh, agreement were not really fully utilized by African states. Um, for example, she said there was no compulsory license has been issued. And I wondered what has hindered that? Um, what are the factors that have hindered that? And that 
builds on what um, Tete had spoken to um, the trips waiver not being the silver bullet. Um, but again, what what has hindered, um, I suppose, learning from what has uh, hindered the development of domestic patent laws, uh, the kind of regional strategy he spoke to that's needed to actually build um, productive pharmaceutical capacity. Um, what, what are some of the factors that have hindered the full realization of these, um, yeah, these international frameworks and you know, regional strategies? Okay, thank you, Anita. And, and I think before we get a response, uh, maybe we'll, we'll have another question as well um, from uh, Kieke. I, I, I apologize if I've uh, mispronounced your name, but go ahead. And you have criminally, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to all the speakers. Um, I think uh, Johnny's question, as well as in a sense, what uh, Noble uh, raised you know, before, uh, it, you know, makes me think about the way that uh, ended his introductory remarks. And another point that he made in passing in his first response to the questions, he ended his introductory remarks by talking about what progressives can do and pointing to the, the importance of uh, being involved in uh, the campaigns around trips as a starting point. So I think that's one thing that is quite clear. And then he also in the sub subsequent remarks, he talked in terms of, uh, you know, a radical change required and uh, looking to the, if you know, something like a bandung. Uh, I think. But at the same time, I, it, that's, that's what actually sets me thinking, because, you know, in, in a sense, it might well be that uh, the possibilities of looking to the state as, you know, the lead agent for change. I mean, where will this change come from to go beyond the trips? Even, you know, implementing the tri trips flexibilities is problematic enough. What can progressives and other people do to take it forward? One of the things I, th I thought was very interesting about it as earlier, uh, his introductory thing, was the way in which he pointed to how the presence and weights of state enterprises, in, in, in this instance, pharmaceutical SOEs in the past, you know, also constituted some kind of, if you like, active embodied material interest, which had to, which was a basis for something real, a reference point that had to be defended, and therefore was a point of, uh, you know, influence in terms of the range and range of bargains and limitations that could be, you know, in, in relation to transnational forces and so on and so forth. In other words, there's a material interest, a constellation of domestic material interests, which had a stake in altering the balance of forces, if you want to use language like that. It, it, the point is, is there such a thing today? Okay, uh, because yes, we can lament, you know, different things. So in Cuba, for example, as Tete himself again points out, there has been this sustained, sustained industry and, you know, a variety of different diverse sectors and subsectors developed around it for 60, 50 years thereabouts. So there is that embodied material interest. But here's the case that we don't have. So how, to look to the states, where else do we go beyond looking to the state? Also, given the fact that the, the weight, the monopoly weight of big pharma in Africa now, as opposed to when they felt it was necessary to have strike a bargain with local domestic interest, it, 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 we, we, can, we, we can see it as constituting an alternative or reconstituted mat embodied material interest. If you look, uh, let's say uh, there was a, a study by, I think, McKinsey, McKinsey Institute, I think it was, if I don't remember it correctly, which pointed to the fact that, uh, you know, Africa was a region where in terms of global the global pharmaceutical industries, there was the biggest price markups, okay? So it may not be the biggest market in terms of volumes, but in terms of price markup, it is the most profitable region anywhere in the world. Now, we, we, we can step back a bit and think of those margins as constituting bringing together a range of, of interest. So there's big pharma and it's global weights in local, uh, global uh, big pharma and it's weight in local domestic markets, but that includes markets where there are local suppliers in terms of different parts of packaging or people who have invested on the basis of that margin in terms of a chain of, uh, you know, pharmacies and other sub sector, which who now have an, and people in the state procurement sector in public health regimes who will even bend down, you know, public health pharmaceutical supplies and stores just to cover their trail of, you know, so on. The same price system ensures that, you know, that it, it makes it profitable to have even a black market in, in pharmaceuticals. So that instead of what, you know, orthodox economists might say in terms of pricing people out of the market, actually all kinds of bizarre distortions are priced into the market here. So with this constellation of interest that dominates, we do have to ask the question, 
where would this a driving force for change, which can reorient not simply policy around intellectual property, but the domestic investment regime, the resource generation regime, give a better quality of uh, you know possibilities to researchers, to people who work the whole chain of the pharmaceutical sector, and so on and so forth. Those who've been denied from PPEs all the way to whatever. What I'm interested in, 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 in exploring further, especially given what I interpreted as the weight of the strategic weight of embedded interest and as a, as, as a moment in which different forces are constituted around a, a, an identifiable balance you know, of, of forces, or identifiable contours around the balance of forces. How do we begin to shift? You know, what would be some of the things that we can do on top of, in addition to, alongside and beyond this, uh, in what progressives can do uh, around the TRIPS uh, uh, issues and how should they do it? Uh, I'll be interested in anybody, uh, including Tate himself, coming back on this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I, I think maybe, maybe before we have a uh, response from Tete, maybe, maybe Rob, you have something to add here from the kind of global perspective. Well, um, I'm not going to speak to the specific questions that were just asked because they're very good. I'm spending a lot of time listening and, and learning and uh, left has, uh, and when it comes to public health problems has um, engaged in, in two activities, um, and of course, much more than that, but for the sake of discussion here, uh, the first is that to, to demand that all the latest medical innovation be provided for all. Um, so that fight along the lines of the fight for trips, uh, the fight for uh, the domestic production that was discussed here, uh, all, all wonderful examples and, and description. Um, and the second thing, of course, is that, um, uh, that, that, of course, public health problems aren't really matters of, uh, of you know, providing uh, or distributing medical innovation, right? This is, uh, we're very much ensconced in the notions of the kind of the societal determinations of, of health. And that health doesn't just merely arise out of access to, to medicines, but also from the, you know, broadly, uh, perhaps the, the best medical intervention might be access to clean water, access to uh, uh, the right to the weekend, access to uh, all, all sorts of variety of, um, of uh, uh, societal interventions that uh, increase, reduce the uh, comorbidities that allow people to live uh, um, long and, and, and uh, healthy lives. I'll, um, I would say uh, what I want to say here you know, um, is that the, the, um, we have to ask ourselves, um, you know, that if the vaccine is indeed uh, necessary, and it is, like here in the United States, 99% uh, of the deaths in June from COVID were from those who were unvaccinated. So clearly, here's an intervention, medical, medical intervention that's necessary to uh, distribute to all around the world. Um, uh, and of course, the, some of the graphs that uh, were, were shown, uh, showing uh, countries hoarding uh, vaccines that they don't use while countries around the world are not to have access to them is utterly uh, um, a crime. Um, and so th that intervention needs to take place. Um, but the thing is, is that the vaccines themselves are also not uh, the magic bullet um, in the sense of it's where the second part comes in. It's where the, the need to... Um, engage in the kind of uh, societal determinations of health that is has to be a part of this. And I think, uh, you know, Johnny brought that up, the notion of the broader political economies, the reasons why some vaccines are chosen over others, has nothing to do with the technical aspects of the vaccines and all these this broader context that uh, the left needs to continue to integrate and bring fo uh, to the fore. The, um, so what I'm getting at is that the vaccines are slowly beginning to fall out of the sky in terms of their efficaciousness. And uh, so as the virus itself evolves, um, it uh, begins to uh, solve the vaccines themselves. And what it really brings uh, uh, home, and it's a, it's a stunning uh, possibility, but also not surprising given the, the histories of the colonial powers, is that the objective here is not to defeat COVID-19, meaning the global North's objective is not to defeat COVID-19. 
um, despite its efforts at kind of uh, uh, the kind of tactical uses of vaccine diplomacy as a way of positioning itself in a new Cold War against China. Um, but we, we so, um, so, so what we've had here is that, uh, you know, clearly we should fight against the uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, we should fight for the TRIPS uh, exceptions. Um, uh, you know, if, if, we, if we were in the business of actually defeating COVID-19, that would have been already done and much of the world would have already been vaccinated at this point. And you have to ask yourself to the extent to which uh, uh, the refusal to do that, uh, what that implies, because it doesn't mean, it implies that COVID, defeating COVID-19 is not the objective. It implies that Gates and the pharmaceutical uh, and research and manufacturers of America and, and their European counterparts are in the business to make sure that that does not happen. Uh, in fact, it's uh, much more important to uh, uh, reset the race between uh, the vaccines and, um, and, uh, and the virus itself into something entirely different, right? Whatever the damage, uh, the collateral damage, right? It's about setting up the race between the, vac the boosters for the new vaccines for those who've already gotten them and can pay for them and the vac and the virus itself. Of course, that is uh, has nothing to do with stopping COVID-19. Because if you if you really want to get us to a global herd immunity, you would do it a blanket vaccine around the world in short order. And they're certainly capable of doing that. And they refuse to do that in order to protect uh, uh, the quarterly profits. And so, you know, what the variants win from a host system that's intent on uh, denying itself herd immunity in favor of profitability, the industry wins from the, vi the, the virus's proliferation and, and turning into new variants. Um, and um, so, and, and that's the case, even as many of the vaccines were first tested in populations in the global South. And the example that comes to mind is the Pfizer vaccine, which was tested on the Brazilian people who are not allowed access to the Pfizer vaccine. Um, so, you know, there are, the smell of uh, war crime begins to circulate. Um, and, and there's an aspect of uh, the absolutely, uh, this, you know, the murderous uh, consequences of, of placing a, a mode of uh, economic production and over the, the well being of millions of people around the world. I'm going to say uh, one last thing, because, um, uh, and it goes along the lines of some of the things that were brought up here. And it really speaks to the left has talked about this in, in short order. And the discussion of the domestic vaccine production, you know, reminds me of Samir Amin's notion of delinking, uh, somehow unplugging out of the uh, uh, global south as much as we can out of the global north. Uh, I mean, if you have a sociopathic uh, governance engaged in uh, profitability uh, over the, the lives of uh, much of the world, then that is not a system to uh, continue on as much also the uh, presently the global north holds all these cards. So all this discussion of, of um, uh, you know, kind of regional cooperation, cooperation across the global south, uh, you know, moving in the direction of, of uh, you know, developing knowledge, biomedical knowledge or public health knowledge, uh, moving toward kind of uh, domestic production of vaccines or all speaks to uh, that notion of kind of uh, unplugging out there. The last thing that uh, comes up is, you know, Che Guevara frightened uh, us all uh, because of the, the vision he had, the notion that we shouldn't just have one Vietnam War, we should have one, two, three as a way of defeating uh, Imperial Global North. It's a frightening prospect if only because of the Vietnam War was itself a, 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 a horror um, because of the, the, the lives that were cost out of that. But if the notion we can move to some aspect of moving to one, two, three, uh, and many Cubas uh, on the biomedical front and the public health front um, as a way of saving lives around the world, as a way of disconnecting out of a sociopathic uh, logic that rewards uh, the wealthy with the bodies of millions around the world. And uh, I think that is truly a, a, a visionary uh, notion of moving forward. And I would say that those of us in the global north, our objective must be uh, to support those efforts. Um, I know that was discussed, uh, the Doha agreement and the notions of activists in the global north helping out, uh, trying to get that, uh, uh, the anti-HIV uh, retroviral therapies uh, available they all. Um, uh, it's an important thing, and I think uh, we need to learn and listen to uh, activists in the global south 
who have an understanding about uh, uh, how this operates and to, to maneuver and, and the history and the knowledge and the practice at how to make this work. And uh, I look forward to uh, collaborating with uh, people as we move forward on this to try to get to uh, make sure that uh, yes, uh, vaccines are distributed worldwide, um, but also this is not the only virus in town, right? Uh, many of us were looking at all sorts of other pathogens that are in circulation. The African swine fever comes to mind that wiped out half of China's uh, hog population um, and hogs have a very similar immune system to humans. So we were all concerned about that in 2018. It's still going on. Um, so this is not the, a short, I mean, we have to think in terms of really transient dynamics, what's gonna happen in the next few months and next couple of years. But I think the attitude of, of this call is, is right on point and the notion of profound, making profound structural changes that uh, involve uh, shifting in such a way that the countries of the global north, I mean, global south are not, um, uh, you know, completely at the mercy of those in the global north whose economic model helped produce the pathogens in the first place, if only by uh, allowing multinational agribusiness, uh, mining and, and uh, um, uh, mining and, and logging to uh, wreck the forests of the global south, increasing the interface between uh, host uh, uh, species with some of the most deadly pathogens that spill over, make their way to the local regional capital and hop on a plane to the rest of the world. So uh, I very much salute everybody. It's uh, been a wonderful conversation. So thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. And, and we, we have had a couple more kind of comments come in, uh, a couple from, from Jörg, but I think you actually might have addressed them as, as you, were, you were speaking. And there's another one from, from Noble as well, but uh, we are coming towards the end of our time now. So um, maybe uh, Tete, if you want to respond to uh, the, that round of questions we had before and, and just kind of make any, any final points that you wanted to before we finish. Okay, thank you. So let me just start with the uh, specific questions and then to the more general ones. So, so Anita asked a question about um, the, the failure or the, the fact that not much compulsory license were issued uh, after the um, trips and public health declaration, Doha declaration, and also links up to what, uh, what are some of the obstacles that will be standing in the way of making better use of the trips whoever this time we get it. Um, I, 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 for, as was hinted, there are two things um, combined to frustrate the issue of compulsory license after Doha. One was the fact that the developed countries, Europe and the United States especially, uh, fought a lot of guerrilla warfare to make sure that both within the WTO and outside it, the concessions that were given in Doha were not um, substantially realized. So the, the actual law that was negotiated in the WTO to give legal effect to the, to the trips declaration put so many exceptions and crosses in it that was became, it became quite difficult, uh, unrealistic to implement them. And then, once they got out of the WTO, the, the um, European Union especially, and also the United States, used other instruments and trade agreements outside the WTO to try and implement, the, the, to try and claw back what they lost in terms of flexibility. So in the, in the economic partnership agreements that the European Union negotiated with African countries for a long time, the intellectual property provision that it was seeking to implement there was, uh, was much more draconian than anything that was in the WTO, including the trips waiver. So, so, so basically the idea was that the, the Northern countries were determined to claw back the uh, flexibility that they, they gave in Doha. And also the pharmaceutical companies were determined also to use all manner of from aid to threat to ensure that African countries did implement uh, the, 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 the waiver. In fact, um, no, Noble who just finished talking sent me some information about polio vaccine and an amount of money that some pharmaceutical companies were prepared to give as aid to African countries so that they will not be able, they will not, they will be discouraged or disincentivized from developing their own vaccines. So there's that, that you know, determined effort from the North to ensure that whatever was won in Doha was not used. But I think that an important element is the attitude that our governments took themselves. Um, it is the strategic choices that they made. So as I said, many countries don't even uh, uh, change their laws. TWN, I remember that Terror Network and allies, we organized 
a seminar for the African Organization of African Unity after Doha with the OAU Secretariat to try and get African countries to begin to adapt their laws. Uh, at a lot of effort and expense, we had a seminar that lasted for three days and there was no pickup. I think maybe at that time, African countries were still in, were still in the hawk about the paradigm of neoliberalism and the, 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 the crisis of 2008 and co-housing come here to educate a lot of people about just how delusionary it was. Um, as, and I suspect also that the domestic forces who were mobilizing for those things were not also strong enough to mobilize. So I, so I think it's a combination of, of those two elements. Now, how do we ensure that um, a similar thing doesn't happen again? It is possible to argue that um, the, the situation is different here and there is a, the, 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 just the recognition of the crisis level that we are and the whole idea about people pushing for alternatives is also stronger. And therefore the opportunities available to take advantage of stronger mobilization that puts pressure on our governments in Africa and the South, but also puts pressure on governments in the North to go beyond simply a legal declaration and a legal instrument to realize the public is an opportunity to take. That's what I can say that this is just an, it, it depends on how strong our mobilization organization is. But how strong in our, our mobilization is will depend upon therefore what coherence we bring to the specific things that we are asking for. And here, I think that it has to be a combination of clarity of, of concrete policy choices that we make, that we put on the table, realizable policies, as well as broad and paradigmatic changes. I, I, I always think, and I remember the, the, the dictum of Amika Cabral, that the people really are not struggling for ideas in anybody's head. They are struggling for concrete changes that will make their lives better to live in peace, send their children to school. And I think that part of the problem that we face in the left is the fact that we kind of uh, swing between broad, broad, broad proclamations of great horizon systemic change without spending enough time to the nitty gritty of specific policies that can be linked up. That could be the levers for mobilization and change. And it seems to me that that's one task that we face now. In the concrete struggle now against the pharmaceutical monopoly in the North, we should be asking ourselves as, as leftists and as progressive, what are the concrete policy instruments that we will take to our government and say, here, this is what we are fighting for, this is what we are mobilizing for. And without that, it's gonna be difficult to actually do the kind of concrete work that we have to do. And that takes me back to the, the some a question that was asked of me before I go to Bazini. The question that was asked, I think by NASA again, that um, in the, the ACFT, I made an argument about that the ACFT is not enough. Uh, and then what else should be done? Um, in fact, um, yeah, this is just an example. When I saw the early template of the intellectual property protocol that the African Union Secretariat was putting forward as the protocol that will be the ACFTA protocol in trips, it, 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 I mean, I was frightened when I saw it because it just it was just a copy and paste from the trips agreement that was the WTO and copy and paste on the trips agreement that was around you know, in, in, in other, other uh, regional trade agreements. Be and, and that is symptomatic of some of the problematic approach to the ACFTA, where African, Africans thought simply by replicating the global natural agenda within their continent, then they are building the capacity to transform their continent. I think a, simp uh, a, a very maybe uh, a minimal thing that we can do is that in addition to trade realization, whatever much we, we think about it, we have to ask ourselves, what the economy is, what, is, what are the supply side obstacles or constraints that we need to build to boost domestic producers, small scale producers to larger scale producers to improve their capacity to produce and trade. If we don't address that question, it doesn't matter how much we liberalize on the continent, we just be creating a big market for the, the current suspect for Europe, Bulgaria, uh, Kazakhstan, China to fill the market. Now, in the case of pharmaceuticals, we know that the, the, the market is created both by producing and by the government procurement that we give for ourselves. So it's a government policy thing. I don't see anything, whether it's trips agreement or tariff agreement, which will address that issue, unless African government, and none of the deregulation ideas in the ACFTA are made to address the issue. So African government must start by saying, how do we build 
pharmaceutical industries that are embedded together with knowledge, science, with local raw materials. How, how do you collaborate? What are the centers that collaborate? Which countries have got the capacity? What kind of node apples will we create? And those are the questions we should be addressing. Once we have those questions, it's possible then to begin to say, this is how we are going to mobilize. Um, finally, if you, if you ask me, I, I, and I think I've hinted this already. Um, I, I think we should, the, 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 funda, the, the fundamental task that we all have is mobilization and organizing your people. As uh, Jaji said, creating forces uh, that we can get them to um, support the change that we want. But I think for the, for the left, actually, the starting point still remains just to have some just clear, concrete, coherent ideas that can be implementable in the immediate, medium, and long term, around which therefore becomes your, your mobilization starting points. And that, I think, is a challenge that we still have. And that is what we should be having conversations about, about, about the concrete. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tete. And uh, thank you to, to all our speakers, uh, to everyone who's attended and contributed. I think this was a really interesting, uh, important discussion. Uh, and I hope you'll you'll join us um, at review of, it, of African international uh, African political economy and um, third world um, network Africa because we have two more um, webinars coming up over the coming weeks. Um, so um, there's one on public uh, popular public health in Africa, lessons from history and Cuba, which I think will be, be interesting to a lot of people here, and also a, a third one on alternative strategies and politics for the global South uh, on climate change. So um, please, um, if you go to uh, either the Third World Network Africa website or uh, rope.net um, and sign up for updates, you, you can uh, find out when those, um, when those are announced. Um, so yeah, thank you all for attending um, and uh, I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much. Really interesting. Really appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you from me too. Really, really interesting and, and great, um, great questions as well. Look forward to the next one. Okay. Oh, well, well, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, Rob and Tete and, and Sheikh. Uh, and oh, I think Njuki might have gone already. But yeah, it was, it was good to meet all of you. And I, I hope to see you uh, again at some point. Okay, definitely. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, present. Uh, show and i look forward to hearing more so thanks that's a very yeah. wonderful meeting you so uh, you hopefully we'll keep in touch and 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 you too every everyone thanks thanks bye-bye